Um, my name is Amanda Long. I'm the Fine Arts Coordinator here at Stevenson, and one of my happy tasks is to coordinate the Visiting Artist Series. And today we are really excited to welcome uh, Christine Rojek. And I've got, um, if you haven't seen it so far, um, on the Visiting Artist website, for, on the SHS site, is her full bio and annotated art list for the presentation. But um, I'll give you some bio highlights uh, as we get started. So Christine specializes in interactive, often kinetic public sculpture. So we're going to see some really exciting works today. Um, her work is often site responsive, uh, installations, um, theatrical, provocative, and uh, her work has become recognized as destination pieces in over 20 locations uh, throughout the United States. So she's created projects with national developers, universities, and municipalities, uh, been awarded a host of grants throughout her career from Illinois Arts Council, City of Chicago, the National Endowment for the Arts, AT&T Technology, and seven professional development grants from Columbia College Chicago, uh, where Christine served as adjunct faculty for over 20 years. Um, before very recently uh, relocating to Austin. We're, we're joined uh, by a brand new Texan today. Um, so Christine was, the last point I'll add is that Christine was a founding member of Chicago Sculpture International, um, Art, Artemisia Gallery? Artemisia. Artemisia Gallery, um, Chicago's first all women cooperative. And she is a co-founder of Sculpt Tours, which is a company dedicated to the advancement of public sculpture. Uh, so with that, um, Christine, if you'd like to share your screen and uh, take it away, I will pass you the okay. mic. Um, I just want to say hi to everybody, and I want to know you're there. Are you really there? I won't be able to hear them, I'm sure. But They, um, they really okay. are. We've got 23 participants with us. And students, I forgot to mention, please utilize that chat. Um, I'll be watching it throughout the presentation. So if you have questions for Christine, I'll jump in and, um, and speak on your behalf. And please don't be shy because, you know, I, I remember very well what it was like to be in high school and or even in college and not wanting to speak up. So um, and I want to make sure that you all are wearing shoes, I hope, but I know I'm not. Um, anyway, I'm going to share my screen and um, let's see. Here we go. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is take you through um, a series of, of pieces. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how I went from just a, you know, an artist who did painting uh, with a painting major and how I went through um, getting to kinetic and public artwork. So uh, there are lots and lots of slides. I hope there's enough time. I'm gonna go kind of fast and I'll be going through a lot of projects uh, that may, may not apply. I'll, I'll just do it very fast. I call this my big bang theory, my big bang approach to uh, a retrospective slideshow. So um, I call myself a lifelong artist because I wake up every day thinking about it. What am I gonna design? What am I going to paint? And what I'm gonna build. And I think that this creates a, a completely cohesive body of work. And as you look at the work, you can see that one thing flows into the next. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, a video to show you the kinetic work. So, so that when you see the actual pieces, uh, you'll be able to um, recognize them and how they work. These are uh, drawings, engineering drawings. Most of this is self-explanatory. This is all hardwoods. And I cut every piece myself. Fountain. The water goes into the back of the bird. And there, this is the bucket in the back of the bird. The bucket fills and causes the wings to, to rise. 
here's the finished piece. You can see this was a really long time ago. by the levers that you slide down. This is inside the shop while we're testing some of the kinetic pieces before they're painted. The shops are really, really dirty <laughs> and dark. And then you end up with a very lovely piece. This is my first, first motor driven piece. So each one of these is wired through the, through the stems of the plant. It's a 30 foot plant. It's called the Kinetic Garden. So for every piece, I do a bunch of, you know, mechanical drawings and I also do renderings just to show how the pieces are going to be painted. And so often I will combine my mechanical drawings with, um, with my renderings. So now I'm going to take you through why I think I became an artist. And you're going to see my, my father who was actually a, a singer and performer. Take me where the drums will wake me. So I begin when my story with my dad, Edmund Rojek, who is Kyle Kimbrough, a boy singer with the big bands. My father's big voice and big personality and big ego electrified our household. Meanwhile, back in our little Portage Park, Chicago bungalow, my mother, Grace Rojek, held down the fort and waited for my dad to come home from his nightclub gigs. She was a groupie with great talent for painting, designing, and sewing anything our hearts desired. She taught me that productivity was necessary, a necessary component of creativity. But I was the performer. I was dazzled, totally bedazzled by my dad and how he performed on stage and how, how everyone lit up when he was in the room. And uh, after observing the life of musicians and comedians, I felt the lure of the limelight. I was convinced that my, my mission was to entertain. Uh, by the time I reached college age, I knew I wanted a major in dance and choreography. I wanted to be Twyla Tharp. This is Twyla Tharp. I don't know if you have heard of her, but she's just a wonderful choreographer. She's in her 80s now, but I just adored her. And, um, but my father, because he was in the show business, he thought I meant showgirl. He didn't understand what choreographer and dancer meant, and neither did I, after, actually. So what he did, and this is uh, sort of unusual probably for today, but my dad, went off and enrolled me at the University of Illinois in painting because I had some, I, I, I did some wonderful art projects. I had never been in, in art before. In high school, I took like just a few classes and I had a phenomenal art teacher who just was always encouraging me. And he thought, you know, he thought that I might be able to pursue this in college, but 
I had no idea that I wanted to do that, but my dad didn't want me to be a dancer. So he enrolled me in the, at U of I and I started doing these three dimensional portraits. And you can see these are, are about, they're almost full size, you know, they're almost life size pieces and they're layered. And I did some, I did just family and friends. This one is the per perpetual walls. I did it of my parents. Years later, I went to, to France and I saw the Manet, Edouard Manet exhibit and saw these pieces that looked an awful lot like what I had done. But I was really very unsophisticated and just did things by, you know, just instinct. This is a portrait of my friend, Mad Ira. So all of these were really dimensional. Sometimes I would use really, I would use like um, denim and fabrics and real things like wristwatches and stuff. And the rest of it was all painted very meticulously. Um, this is uh, something that surprised me after I joined Artemisia Gallery. Um, my work was seen by the president of the Museum of Contemporary Art, just a completely, took me by surprise and they asked me if I would do the portrait of their whole family. So these portraits really started to become, you know, like a big deal in my life. And I was working constantly when I graduated from college, I just did one after another. I had commission work. I wasn't making a lot of money, but I was making money, which was a complete surprise to me and to my family. Uh, so then I call this the beginning of the end of the beginning. And what happened was I, I went to a school in France and studied there. I, uh, I was encouraged by my sister to take some classes there because she had studied abroad. And I went to a place called Fontainebleau. I also joined Artemisia Gallery, which was a, a women's, all women's cooperative gallery. And at the time, this Marvin Glass shootout. I was actually doing a portrait of Marvin Glass, the head of the toy company. And five of the people, this kind of, I noticed a downer, but while I was working on it, five of the people at the company, including the person who was commissioning me, was shot by a crazy lunatic in, in the, in the uh, it was just like one of those weird things, mental health thing. So my life changed overnight. I went away to France. I studied at Fontainebleau, the American School of Art in Fontainebleau, France. And there was just a completely different kind of approach to art. We did installations, we made costumes, we danced through our work. We, we created these like personas and architectural shapes. And it was just sort of like the, the incorporating art into life and and not and blurring the lines between painting and sculpture and performance it was wonderful so i came back and i thought what on earth am i going to do with this i was i really didn't want to do any more of of the straight portraiture even though i was having some success with it um, i call this um the public is invited and what I did was started started to do to incorporate what I was interested in, you know, personally interested in, which was dance and and um, theater. And I made these puppets, and they're life size. They hang in the middle of the room. I put like um, some symbolic mirrors and uh, hung screening wire screening and painted on it and created shadows. So I invited the public to walk through these installations. They were made of plexi plexiglass wood and um, an acrylic paint. So um, from there, I thought, ah, I'm not like doing enough of the, of the hands-on, of the actual dance and, and the stuff that I loved. And so I was always doing my work while I was playing loud music and dancing. And well, I was young, what do you expect? So um, I call this the point where I made performers of pedestrian. And this is the birth of contrapula contraptualism because I made these contraptions that made sounds. I made instruments for movement. And these pieces brought you through a series of, of instruments. In the upper left is a harp that I strung from ceiling to floor and you played the strings. They're monofilament strings that you play. This one is a bunch of uh, sheet metal instruments that are hanging from the ceiling. 
the piece in the in the bottom are cricket are, are stepping stones that are on springs and there are little clickers and clackers inside that make sounds. These are rocking shoes that made a tapping sound when you played. But those pieces were for extroverts and a, only people who really wanted to call attention to themselves would actually get involved with them. So then I, I created a series called the Sonic Playground where I put um, tables and chairs and made drums out of them and whistle seats. And uh, this is a teeter totter that makes sound with bellows. This is a rotating musical love seat. And um, I'll show you a little piece of this. That's the teeter totter. You'll see me when I was very young. <laughs> I decided that I would make a hybrid sculpture that would combine uh, a piece of furniture, something that was very familiar to people, and um, make it into an instrument at the same time. So the next piece that I built like that was, was this table and chair. Chair is called rhythm table. And it's uh, something I realized that if I if I made it in the form of a musical table and chairs, and they would walk up to it, there were four seats or four four separate areas for them to put their hands, and they immediately would sit down, and and a horn would go off. So here are some close-ups. Amanda, I'm going to have to ask you for the time. I turned my phone off. So. Oh, sure. Once we're in a while. Right. Once in a while. Sure, we're uh, at 1225 right now. We've got uh, just under 20 minutes for the whole class. Okay. Um, so anyway, here are, now I, I told you that you saw, you would see some moving pieces that I did. And um, now we're getting into the details of the still shots. This piece was um, installed at the uh, Chicago Children's Museum for over 25 years. It had like millions of reps. It's now in storage. And uh, I'm not sure whether they're going to put it up again, but it was a gorgeous piece that had, you know, all handmade mallets and the mallets uh, were triggered by sliding down the levers, the piano keys. This one you saw, this was the, um, the bird that, that was made by hand. I'll just do a real short clip of that one. And so, um, from this, I, I had always worked indoors with, with wood and with paint and everything was um, kind of fragile in a way. I mean, it had to be, to be uh, handled gingerly. So what happened was um, I suddenly got a commission for an outdoor piece. And I was just sort of thrown into the world of public sculpture. Um, I, I had the, the really good fortune to have the head of public sculpture um, tell me that it was time for me to, to make my work larger and to take a chance with, with public commissions. And he really encouraged me to, to do my pieces uh, in more permanent materials. So as luck would have it, um, I got a commission from the state of Illinois and uh, for, for the uh, physical education building at Northeastern Illinois University. And um, I had no idea how to go about translating my work into steel and aluminum. And I just kind of found my way through it, just you know, worked my way. And um, it wasn't about making money, that's for sure, because most people who do their first public commission can tell you that it's a really easy to lose money doing this. But I was really fortunate to have a husband who's an architect and he coached me and trained me to present and to detail and to draw things as though I were an architect. And this piece represents so many pages of drawings and um, just to detail all of the, the banners and how they bend and how they're, uh, these are five eighths inch steel banners and they were bumped into shape. These pieces I created by um, making um, wooden molds and casting them. So it was really a, a very big deal and I was hooked. You, 
can see that the piece is a kinetic work that is interactive. The piece I did for the Woodlands, Texas. So those are pretty bad um, images and at the time video was just really rough and everything but I'm so glad I captured some of it because when you see the actual uh, images in you know uh, digital images you can tell what was happening so this catfish is is pulled up by a, by a rope and he expands uh, you can tell the size of it so it's quite a quite a jump for me um, my husband and I took a lot of chances and just for the love of it, just to learn it. And it wasn't, didn't have anything to do at that time with making money or anything. It was just about learning and just the thrill of seeing something that large and, um, and just to, to, to realize it. So, um, Large is, is good. I mean, it was pretty thrilling to go and install these pieces. The pieces, uh, some of these pieces, many of the pieces were water jet cut. And what that is, is you put your drawings into AutoCAD and you, you, uh, you interface with a high pressure jet of water. It's a, it's a cutting machine that uses a high pressure jet of water with an abrasive in it and it follows the patterns. Uh, the digital patterns from AutoCAD, it's phenomenal. So you don't have to stand there and, and cut them by hand like I used to. Um, but this piece, which I did for the love of it, I did it for the, um, I did it for the uh, sculpture walk at Navy Pier. And so it was a speculative piece, which means that you are not paid for it. You're not commissioned, you take a chance. You fund the piece yourself you put it in an exhibit and you hope for the best. And um, this one is called Eka Ura, and it means now or never. And it's an adjustable sundial. It's about 12 feet by 12 by 12. Um, and the figures are, they're displaying like a, a stop action dive into the pool. It, what I was trying to say is, if you're gonna do something, do your very best, like right now, just if you're gonna get in the pool, do it a fancy way, right? Um, so I showed that piece and later sold it to the um, Prairie Center for the Arts. I mean, much later, like um, years later. <laughs> and it just went, this piece went around and um, was on exhibit. So you can see this in, in Schomburg at the Prairie Center for the Arts. This is a, a detail of that piece, the Kinetic Garden, which really is no longer. The shopping center was, was sold and I got first right of refusal, refusal for the piece. And um, so I said, what on earth am I gonna do with this? So I actually, I, I had a friend who had a, had a farm and we, I just said, I'll take it. And so I, I still have some parts and pieces of this and, and I've reconfigured and worked. I turned one into a wind driven piece. Um, it's kind of crazy, you know, <laughs> how, how these things happen. This is in the shop working on a piece that you saw in the video that is um, for a children's museum and entry sculpture for a children's museum. I'm showing you this because the shops are so dirty. And so, you know, you just go through so much labor trying to get these pieces out. And then later they're beautiful. You, you never see the pain that was involved or the, or the hard work or your rough hands. So this is how it looked after um, it was installed in uh, Columbia, South Carolina at Adventure Children's Museum. And it represents, it is called Echo Chambers and it represents the balance of nature and how one thing can just tip the balance off and cause, you know, uh, the, the teeter-totter, the wheel at the, at the base moves the fish, the fish moves the teeter-totter, the teeter-totter moves the child. And it just sort of shows that we need to have this balance in nature in order to have 
everything work properly. The four, um, there are four uh, sections of highly finished painted um, murals that these are cut out of aluminum and uh, they're actually hand painted. Um, I do a lot of that where I'll spray most of the piece and then I'll do details that are hand painted and then I'll put a clear coat, an automotive clear coat on top so it can withstand the weather. Christine, do you mind if I jump in with a question or two? Of course. Um, we had two questions come in about uh, the, the time it takes to create these amazing projects. Um, huh. So I'm going to put them together. We've got, you know, on average, uh, wondering how long it takes to plan out the artwork um, before you start to build it. And then another question about um, how long do you think, you know, the longest time period was for you to create a piece? Well, you know, a lot of it has to do with the proposal process. The proposal, you know, first you go in, sometimes you're competing with people, you do scale maquettes, you do studies, then you go on to, you know, uh, to, to interface with the community and they have to accept it. So that lead time could be six months, it could be a year. And then I would say that, you know, a lot of the more complicated pieces might take another nine months or something. It's like having a baby, you know, something like that. So it's, it's really quite complicated because you go from really detailed, you, you go from concept, little tiny concept models and studies, and then you go to the, to the more intricate uh, three inches equals one foot model stage so that you can actually kind of call out the materials and everything and, and kind of psych out how things will be rolled and, and so on. So it, it, it just, and then you go to actual construction documents, which sometimes, which most of the time, if it's in the public, have to be approved by an engineer. And so they have to be actually meticulously drawn. And so it, it, the whole process can take, uh, you know, a year to get the commission and a year to build it. So anyway, here's one for, is, is there anything else? Oh, well, you know, you hit another question, which was about um, about small scale models. Um, the yeah. other questions that have come in, uh, which you may speak to as you carry on in your presentation is um, whether or not you have a favorite piece that may be like picking oh. a favorite child. Um, oh, yes, I do. And do I you? hope I have time to get to okay, it. Okay, we'll, we'll let you get there. And How then another, the other question that came in, uh, we've got about just under 10 minutes. Okay. And the other question that came in is um, whether you have a preference for your outdoor or indoor works. Oh, that's, I love everything. <laughs> it's like you're, they're like your children, you know, I don't throw anything away. Um, I keep every little study. My husband can't stand it. <laughs> he thinks I'm a hoarder. <laughs> so anyway, this is a piece that um, is earthbound spiral. And this is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It has, it, it, describes the point at which the earth meets the heavens okay so this is this upper one upper arm has solar collectors and it has a symbolic figure of the heavens or the unknown where it meets the earth and in the earth side all of the animals and plants and birds and everything are are, are uh, carved or cut out into the spiral arm. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of how the, uh, the sun shines through the cutouts and, and, is, it, and communicates with the earth. The sun communicates with the earth through those cutouts and also through the, um, the solar collectors and this, this side of the arm is supposed to glow at night, however, it's near a building that has too much light. So I was very disappointed. <laughs> I wish it could glow more than it does. But anyway, um, here, I'm gonna go really fast now. This is, um, this is a wind-driven piece called Rubber Tipped Crane. And you can see this, this is in the collection of the village of Schaumburg. This is installed at the town square near you. Um, there are a couple pieces that you can see, the Northeastern Illinois University piece, you can see at the Physical Education Building, this one. Um, here's one that's actually coming back to me today. This is the one that I was telling you about, it's coming back in a crate. It was, um, it's, it's been on display in Palm Desert. So we had to crate it up into two pieces. 
and um, my husband is off getting this right now to bring it back home. Uh, here's a piece that I did for uh, Nemours Children's Hospital in Orlando. And it, I worked with a wonderful, um, you know, uh, so many of these pieces as I got more in, involved in kinetics and everything, I cannot take full, full credit for all of the, the wonderful things that happened because I worked with a toy designer named Gordon Barlow, who actually was one of the ones who did Mr. Machine and all these wonderful kinetic works. Um, Gordon Barlow was amazing. Um, Christopher Furman, who builds a lot of robots. Um, Vector Fabricating, who is my, you know, my right arm. Uh, they take care of the, the structural elements, the big structural elements. And uh, so I'll just breeze through some of these. This is in Sarasota. This is a piece that you can see. Um, it's at the, in the Naperville uh, DuPage Children's Museum. It's called Parting the Prairie. It describes how the, how the steam engine changed the prairie landscape. And it, it is, uh, it used to be kinetic. Now they're not, uh, they haven't been taking care of it, unfortunately, but this is how it worked. That's the heartbreak of kinetic pieces when you do public sculpture, because there really isn't um, interest in, in keeping up and maintaining. So, um, so I'm taking you into the studio into the, uh, into the factory and this is how pieces are made. I, this one I made out of foam and cast into aluminum. And that's how we test the pieces. This one, now you're talking about my favorite piece. So this part of that piece is a counterbalanced um, prairie grasses and prairie flowers. And I was so inspired by the way they moved that I made a proposal for a full installation called Breeze Keeper for the sculptures, Sculpture on the Grounds competition at the Evanston Art Center. And I won the competition. Here's a little inside look at how, oh, let me just say that this is supposed to represent the, the um, planting rows in a farm. So there are these wavy cutouts. This is just a little scale model, but go up to the next figure and you see that I have uh, had the water jet uh, CNC machine. I cut out all these um, landscape pieces. And then I went to the, to the factory and cut out my own. I didn't have money for water jet for all the, the plant parts. So I cut them out. It was a, a hundred degree summer. I cut them out on a bandsaw <laughs> and there was really very, very small um, allowance for this piece. So I cut them all summer and this is how I felt when I finished. So I had a couple people helping me clean up the metals but for the most part, it was just ridiculous, ridiculously hard. So there were six prototypes and they are, they balance on a Teflon ball and there are six prairie images and I just kept repeating them. They have a long pole with, with a counterbalance at the bottom. So I made hundreds of them. No, 72. This is the crew helping me install the, the landscape or the, uh, the landscape rows. And this is a, a shot of it at the Evanston Art Center. Here's me installing the um, kinetic parts, the moving parts with the steam, uh, steam camp at Purdue North Central. So that was just such a, such a kick. And this piece, like it's called Breeze Keeper. Um, it's about 28, 30 feet wide. You know, it has four sections, landscape sections. Christina, and I'm so sorry to, uh, to start to wrap this up, but I wanted to let you know, we have just about one minute left before the oh. students will need to take the break between this period and the next, but okay. um, I'm so glad we got to see your favorite piece. I was wondering, um, oh, someone just asked if that was your child in the picture. Um, oh no, but I have, <laughs> let me just show you this. Please. And then, and then you'll, 
you'll see what, um, how it became sort of an interactive piece as well, wind-driven, interactive, because what surprised me is that people would go under it and play with it. Yeah. So, okay, so I have lots of new work to show you, but um, it's all right. Uh, These images, um, if folks were curious to see more of your work, um, you know, we've got your website listed on our website and on our social media. Is that someplace that folks could see more of your work? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. Well, we're really glad that you could join us today, Christine. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank right. you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Hyken. Thank you, students. Yeah. Thank you, students. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. <laughs>